What do you, James Hype, and me 20 years ago all have in common? At one point, we all bought our first ever set of decks. And we didn't have a clue how mm -hmm. any of it worked. I want to invite you on an action-packed tour of your new equipment, and by the end of this video, you'll have done your first ever DJ mix. It doesn't matter what decks or controller you've bought, you'll be able to follow along with everything in this video. If you're a complete beginner DJ who's never so much as twiddled a bass snob before, this is for you. First of all, I'm gonna cover some basic DJ concepts. Then we'll walk through your new gear step by step. And finally, I'm gonna teach you how to do your first ever DJ mix. We've got a lot to cover in this one, so everything's timestamped. Make sure to re-watch anything that you're not sure about, or skip ahead if you're already familiar with some of the concepts. Are you ready? Let's go. If you're on a controller, plug the USB cable into your laptop. Plug your speakers into the master out at the back of the decks. Load up whatever software came with the decks. This is normally Rekordbox or Serato. If you're on standalone decks, plug the decks into channels one and two of the mixer, plug the speakers into the master out, and pop in the USB stick with your music on it. Plug your headphones into the headphone jack, and then if it needs it, give it some electricity. Let's jump in and start by taking a look at deck one, the smuggest of all the decks. The controller I'm using today is the DDJ-1000. Yours may look a bit different to this, but don't worry, all the functions I talk about today will be available on any piece of DJ equipment. Let's move across from left to right like some sort of OCD crab. On the left is deck one. This plays and allows you to navigate and control the speed of a track you've got loaded onto it. The middle section here is the mixer. The mixer isn't just a delicious addition to a stiff drink, but the way you transition from deck one to deck two and alter the sound and volume of what you're playing. If you have a DJ controller like this, the mixer will be part of the unit. If you have standalone equipment, then it will be its own separate device. On the right hand side, you have deck two, which does exactly the same as deck one, but it's just got a bit more of an attitude problem. It's time to handle your first knob, the track selector. This lets you browse the tracks in your DJ software or on your USB stick and load them to the deck. On a controller like this, you just twist it to browse up and down your playlist and then press in to load it to the deck itself. On some controllers like the DDJ400, that load button may be separate. First of all, we have the play and pause button. Once you have a track loaded onto your deck, you can press that to start and stop it. Next, we have the pitch fader. This is where you make a permanent adjustment to the speed of the track so that you can match it with whatever's playing on the other deck. You move it down to speed up the deck and up to slow it down. That's right, it's in reverse. Most controllers have something called master tempo or key lock. This allows you to speed up or slow down a track without making it sound absolutely ridiculous. And now with it off. Here, we have the lesser spotted jog wheel. Unlike DJs, they often travel in pairs. The jog wheel is not a wheel that's into light cardio, but it's got three main functions. The first is navigating the track. If you see the waveform here or in your DJ software, you can move the starting position of the track by moving the jog wheel. Forwards to move forward through the track, and backwards to move backwards through the track. The second thing it allows you to do is make small temporary adjustments to the speed. You do that by moving just the edge of the jog wheel here. Clockwise speeds it up a little bit or nudges it forwards, and anti-clockwise slows it down or nudges it backwards. The third reason for the jog wheel is to let you do massive backspins and look really cool. I'm the greatest DJ in the world. There are usually two modes for the jog wheel, vinyl mode and not vinyl mode. On here, this is changed with a button up here. Yours may be different. Vinyl mode makes the jog wheel act like a piece of vinyl on an old style turntable. Touch the jog wheel on top and it will stop the track. Release it and it will play it again. Touch and hold to move the track backwards and forwards. Nudge the side clockwise to speed up the track slightly or anti-clockwise to slow it down a little bit. It's a really handy tool when you're making slight adjustments in a transition if it's not quite lined up with the other track. When the jog wheel is not in vinyl mode, the whole thing essentially acts like this side platter here. So you can touch the top without it stopping the track. Next up is the Q button. This is a really important button to get to grips with. The Q button acts a bit like a bookmark on a track. In this example, I want to set a cue at the drop of the track instead of the intro. 
To do this, I navigate to the point in the track where I want to set the cue, and then I hit the cue button. As you can see, the software's added a little arrow to show that that's where the cue point is now set. From now on, when I press and hold the cue button, the track will play from that point, and when I release it, the track will stop and go back to the cue point. If I hold it down and then press play, the track will continue playing regardless of if I lift my finger off the cue button. This is a really handy tool when you don't want to play the track from the start every time, a bit like a level select cheat code. On the left, a flock of performance pads, grabbing an early morning drink. Delicious. Most DJ controllers have some kind of performance pad, but CDJs don't. They're basically buttons that are designed to be used while you're mixing that apply different functions or effects to the track which is loaded and playing on the deck. These functions vary depending what controller you have and also what software you're using, so I'm not going to go into them in this video. If you'd like me to cover them in a future video, let me know in the comments. Movement in the bushes. The beat sync button. Highly poisonous to new DJs. This button automatically matches the BPM of both the tracks you have loaded. It sounds like a cheat code for DJing, and it is. And that's why you shouldn't use it as a beginner DJ. We're not going to worry about beat matching in this video, but doing it manually and by ear is by far the best way to make yourself a better DJ in the long term. It'll also avoid you listening to moaning from other DJs for the rest of your life. Next on our tour is the mixer. DJ mixers take several audio inputs and combine them and output them as a single signal. You can split the mixer into columns, which are called channels. Each channel controls one audio source. This is usually a DJ deck, but it can also be anything else that you have plugged into your mixer, for example, a phone. This controller has four channels. Yours might only have two. If it's only got one, you probably actually just bought a toaster. The channels are normally numbered to tell you which one relates to which deck, starting from top to bottom. The first thing you normally see on a mixer is something that allows you to select the audio source that it's using. If you're on a DJ controller, that's normally going to be USB. Under that, you have a trim or gain control. This is essentially the overall volume or signal for that channel. As you can see when I press play, we'll also get this audio meter lighting up. You use the trim to adjust that so that it lands in the orange. Anything higher than that and your audio will start to get distorted. Next we head on to the EQ section. Most mixers split these into three different parts that you can control. You have the high section, which is usually things like hi-hats and percussion, mids, which is normally where your vocals and synths live, and then low, which is where your kick drum and bass live. The default position is at 12 o'clock. To reduce one of these, you turn it to the left, and to increase it, you turn it to the right. Let me show you how each of these sounds now. We're gonna start with the high, then do some mid, and then the lows. For now, I recommend just leaving these at the 12 o'clock position, which means they're unchanged. EQs are one of the main tools that DJs use to manipulate music while they're mixing. For now, it's okay that you just understand how these work and what they do. Underneath the EQs, it's very common to have a high or low pass filter. Pioneer builds this into something called color effects, which are essentially different effects you can add to the channel. Your controller may just have a normal low high pass filter. These do a similar job to EQs, but they manipulate multiple frequencies at the same time. The high pass filter will remove more bass and mids as you turn it up, and the low pass will remove more high and mids as you turn it down. First I'll show you how the high pass filter sounds, and then I'll show you how the low pass filter sounds. Beneath that, we have these Q buttons, and I'm going to come back to them in just a moment. We then have these volume faders here, and as the name suggests, these simply turn the volume up or down on that particular channel. If it's all the way down, you won't be able to hear anything while the track is playing, and if you pull it all the way up, then you'll be able to hear it at maximum volume. You'll notice that even if this is all the way down, you'll still get a reading on your audio meter here, and this is to help you when you're lining up the track but the audience can't yet hear it. 
Most controllers or mixers also have somewhere to control your microphone. Sometimes you get some EQs to play around with like on here. But it can also be just a volume control and that works in a similar way as the other channels. The final thing to talk about is the master section here. And this shows you the level of the signal that is going out to your speakers and out to the audience. In the same way as the channel signals here, you wanna keep this in the orange zone. Depending on your controller, there may also be a booth section here. The booth is a separate output from your master. It can go to a separate set of speakers that you can listen to as the DJ to help you beat match. There's often a section on your mixer dealing with effects as well. And these are different effects that you can apply to the overall sound or sometimes to individual channels. Because these vary depending what software you have and what controller you have, I'm not gonna go through it here. The viewer reaching for the like button, attempting early afternoon snack. One of the key principles in DJing is cueing the next track. This means that you can hear it, but the crowd can't. The other principle is looking pretentious. There's two main reasons that cueing a track is important. The first is it would sound awful to the audience if they heard you doing it. The second is it would ruin the surprise of the upcoming track, a bit like opening your kids' presents before Christmas and burning them. By using these cue buttons here, I can decide what inputs I want to hear in my headphones. If I'm already playing a track on deck one and I want to line up a track on deck two, I press the Q button for channel two here, and this, even if the volume is all the way down, will let me hear what's going on in deck two. If I also want to get a better idea of what the crowd is hearing in my headphones, I can click the Q button on the master channel. Most controllers normally then let you blend between the master signal and what you're queuing up so that you can get a nice balance and clearly hear the two beats. You've also got a headphone volume control here, which is pretty self-explanatory. Just be careful not to blow your eardrums out because these things can go pretty loud. Finally, we have the crossfader. We're not talking about the YouTube channel. You can, for example, assign deck one to this side and deck two to this side, blend between them just by moving this left to right. You'll see under each of the channels, there's this little switch here. It may be in a different place on your controller. It lets you assign which side of the crossfader this channel is on. So as you can see, we've got A through and B. So if I want this to be on the left-hand side here, I would set that to A. If I want it to be on the right-hand side, I would set it to B. And if I want it to just ignore the crossfader altogether, which is what I recommend for now, I just set that to through. And that means if you accidentally knock the crossfader while you're playing, it's not gonna stop or affect the track. These days, the crossfader has become a bit like an appendix for modern DJs. It's there, it once served a purpose, but for most DJs who aren't scratch DJs, it's just really a cause of infection. Blending your tracks using the up faders allows for many more creative opportunities, particularly once you start to move beyond mixing with just two decks. The crossfader is mainly used for scratching these days and I'm not gonna embarrass myself by doing that. Okay, I know what all the buttons do, but how do I do my first mix on this thing? Come with me, we're gonna do it now. It's time to finally use this thing for what it was designed for and do our first transition. What we're gonna do is play a track on deck one and then when this song hits the outro, we're gonna start playing the intro to deck two. We're not gonna worry about beat matching here. All we're trying to practice is getting this one to start at the right time. Before we start, make sure all your EQs are set to 12 o'clock on channel one and channel two. Load up your tracks on deck one and deck two if you haven't already. Use your pitch faders to make sure both your decks are set at the same BPM. If you're finding this difficult, I recommend just using the same track on both decks. Make sure the volume on deck one is up and the volume on deck two is down. This means the crowd will only be able to hear deck one. To help with the timing, I recommend counting along to the beat in your head. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You can even tap on the deck while you're counting to help you hit play at the right time. When you press play, your timing might be a little bit off. And remember, you can use the jog wheel on the side just to give it a little nudge forward or backwards. You wanna have your beat grid looking like this so they both line up. Eventually, you're gonna be able to do this by ear, but this is your first mix, so give yourself a break. To save time, I've moved this track forwards a little bit, but you can start from the beginning when you press play. And remember, we're looking to press play on this deck when this hits the outro. Let's go. One, two, three, four. 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 Use the jog wheel to adjust the track if you need to. Start bringing it in. More. 
keep making adjustments if you need to. And start bringing track one down. And get ready to transition fully over. You've twiddled knobs before, haven't you? I hope now you're as excited about getting started DJing as I was 22 years ago. God, I'm old. You might be thinking the next thing you need to learn is how to beat match. Delete that search query right now because there's an even more important skill that all DJs need to know, probably the most important. That's why you should watch this video next where I teach you about the basics of song structure and phrasing. We're going to get your ears down the gym and teach them how to become the next Andy C, Andy or Andrea D.